Hello friends, we are now with Matthew Arnold, in the company of Matthew Arnold, in the Victorian age, study of poetry. Now, you know, it's the time when you are at a very, very crucial uh, moment in the history of English poetry, we can say. Chaucer has ended. You have seen the film, no? Enter the Dragon, like that. So here it is, Enter Chaucer, with his Canterbury Tales. Now, before that, uh, the Roman, Roman dealer Rose and so on, he had written. But what made him famous today is the Canterbury Tales and the prologue to Canterbury Tales. I don't think there is anybody who hasn't read that, no? One that April lay with his sure as sute. One that April lay with his sure as sute. The drought of March, the drought of March, March had percent to the root. Middle English, no? It's very nice to read, no? Yes? And bathed every, every vine in switch liko of virtu engendered is the flow of virtu, of which virtu and the red is the flow. So that was a real entry. Because as you can see, you know, the, the lines, first 18 lines, I think everybody knows the first 18 lines. If you are a PhD student or English literature student, definitely you must have, you must have read it, no doubt about it, even the commentary on that. So you will find spring, spring season, there is life everywhere. Then there is, there is altogether what you say now. When you find that the qualitative change, you find. A qualitative change, tremendous change, see. Like the entry of Bruce Lee into that uh, island, where was a king, he was like a king, not Bruce Lee, but the owner of that island. I forgot his name. Now, it was a quality, like when Andrew Shakespeare, see, the very few people you will find, they started, uh, they, they came and they made a tremendous changes. So here you can see, English poetry was, we can say, what, hanging behind or something like that, we can say, uh, the French romantic poetry, French romantic poetry, suddenly there is a change, a freshness. Just, just as we see the freshness in the first 18 lines, you find a freshness in the history of the English poetry also. Understand? One that April. So we can say, one, one that great poet Chaucer entered the arena. So you can say like that. You can have a parody like this, isn't it? Isn't it? And drought of March hath percent to the root. We can say that the romantic poetry of uh, the of the romance of the French romances. They were changed, changed, changed. No, there was, he effected such a great change. So it's a person to the root. Right? That is the root of the poetry, so to say. He changed. See there. And afterwards you can see Mac and, Mac and Melody, Sephiroth, West Wind, and there is the movement and the activity among the among the palmers, among the pilgrims, exactly like that. There were activity in among the English poets. A group of poets are known as Chaucerians. And the Spencer, Mil Milton, Keats, they were they inherited this great uh, Shakespeare also. Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton and Keats. They were, they were inheritors of the uh, tradition set by Chaucer. So you can see, you know, these 18 lines you can convert into or use for the entry of, entry of uh, Chaucer in English poetry, in English poetry. Because there was such a, such a, such an activity, you know, you'll find. See, it? a brand new, you find a, a, a new dawn. It's like April, as fresh as the month of May, words coming, as fresh as the month of rhymes, words, themes, coming like this, no? one after another, and it becomes a wonderland of English poetry. 
Therefore, that's why people say, no, even I uh, say, he was the dramatist of all great dramatists. He was the satirist of all great satirists. He was the poet of all great poets. He was, a, he was the father of short story even. Yes. See that, because after all, what is it? The short story is known after all. The Nance Priest stayed, tale. If you haven't read it, you must read it, read it. Like the prioress tale, all these tales are like that. It's very interesting if you are, especially if you are, uh, when you are now it is time, summer vacation, time for spending time on, this is time for spending some time on Chaucer and the prologue to Canterbury Tales. And our tales themselves, so one after another you can read the tale told by the very perfect gentle knight and all those things you can see. Okay, so Chaucer is the father of our splendid English poets. Our, whenever I say our, please don't misunderstand me, it's not mine. It is Matthew Arnold. Because we are now studying Matthew Arnold's the study of poetry. So the splendid English poetry is this. Chaucerians, Chaucerians they say, the gold dew drops of speech. The gold dew drops of speech. That is it. And we can see that with him is with him is the new chapter. Uh, with him is born our uh, great poetry we can say. Or the real poetry. With him is born. Well of English undefiled tendencies. Well of English undefiled. See? But Cowley did not find anything worth it in Chaucer. That doesn't matter. So, he said he was actually an irresistible genius. He simply could not resist him. There are such people, you know, in this. In this, uh, you can see, I, I don't know whether you are familiar with the Hindi actor, uh, that, um, oh, what is his name? Uh, but yeah, I forgot his uh, Dilip Kumar. Ah, yes, Dilip Kumar. An irresistible actor, a genius in that way. Now he's not acting, as you know, but he's irresistible. You can't find, there's no, uh, you cannot replace him. The person that I don't want to say because there are many irresistible actors now. But if I say, if I take the name of one or two, sometimes you may misunderstand. Therefore, I don't want to. I don't want to take those names, but now he is not acting and therefore in the fag end of his life and therefore I can say that he was an irresistible. He was a genius as well, irresistible genius. Chaucer's divine liquidness of style, his divine fluidity, see, his lovely charm, his diction, see? and these have been inherited by Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton and Keyes. They are the English Chaucerians. Lovely charm of his movement. So, a single line will do. If you want to oh, mark your sound of virginity. Single line will do. As he has already said, to test the greatness of a poet, touched on, just one line will do. You need not give a whole passage. That is, and, and uh, he gives, Matthew Arnold himself gives this line, and that line, oh, martyr sounded in virginity. See that? That single line is enough for the lovely charm, the lovely diction, the lovely, the movement, the divine fluidity. So, what are these things you have to feel for yourself? When I said divine fluidity of his lines, then again I uh, explain that. I cannot explain that. I think nobody can explain. As uh, it is said, you, know, you can't teach literature. You can teach about literature. You, you can't learn literature. You can learn about literature. Who said, you know, who, that is Northrop Fry in his archetypal criticism. Archetypes, he says, you can't teach, you can't learn. But about that you can, like that. And I say fluidity, I can't teach fluidity to you, but you can feel it. So that, or I can say about, he makes an epoch, 
and he forms a tradition. Two keywords, he makes an epoch and he forms, founds F-O-U-N-B-S, he founds a tradition. And then he see, he has, sing, he, he has got the virtue, the manner and the movement. Not, you want to find that in romance poetry, French romance poetry. See, the prior tale, the story of the Christian child murdered in a jury. Beautiful lines quoted by Matthew Arnold himself. The tale told by uh, Prioress. And that's about a Christian child murdered in a jury. J-E-W-R-Y. Jury. Jew. No? Yes, what is it? And what does the lines are like this? My throat is cut and my neck a bone. My throat is cut and my neck a bone, said the child. And as and as by way of kind, that is middle English now, where the last e is pronounced, like the April day, kind. I should have died. Yeah, long time ago. I should have, because neck a bone, the, the, the cutting is <laughs> there, the cutting is up to the neck a bone. So long since I would have died, he says. Yeah, long time I've gone. It's a ego, ego. But Jesus Christ, as, as he in books find it, as you find in books, as you read in books, Jesus Christ came and then helped me. Will there this glory lust and be in mind? So the glory of Jesus Christ was in my mind. Will that his glory last and he in and be in mind? And for the worship of his mother Vera <laughs> to last for the lasting glory of Jesus Christ and for worshipping his mother dear dear yet may I sing O Alma loud and clear understand I should have died much earlier but I am still living why because the kindness of Jesus his glory has to last forever and I should sing I should get the opportunity to sing Alma Alma means mother, Alma Mata means my mother, our mother, Alma means our. You call your, uh, ins your institution where you study Alma Mater, Mater means mother, Mata. Latin is Mater, M-A-T-E-R, Mata. So maternal angle, you have got the English word, no? maternal angle, the other is paternal angle, Pater is father. Okay, then he says that, uh, so it is because of that, oh Alma, loud and clear. Because so, two, uh, six, seven lines all together. So they say, how beautiful, the fluidity, the movement, this is we can feel. Nothing to obstruct, you know. Like hair melodies are sweet, but those on head are sweet. Or like was this the face, the lost thousand ships burn the top, the star, flies. That is, that is fluidity. Understand? This is not labor. But if you can see some poems you will find, no? especially modern poems you will find, the movement is somehow obstructed. But this, or you can see those famous lines, no? I'm miles to go before I sleep. That's what it is. Or as I have other tourist experience, no? oh, uh, this uh, to be or not to be, see? to be not to be or not to be speech, see? This mortal, and we will have shuffled this mortal coil and so on, we say, that passage there. Or like that, or any Shakespeare. Shakespeare has rightly inherited the fluidity of movement and the lovely charm of diction that Chaucer, uh, Chaucer uh, bequit, you can say, to the next generation of poets. Understand? So, says, uh, his his talent. These lines will speak for his talent. But at the same time, there's a problem. What is the thing? He has contributed much. He is the splendid, uh, the well of English undefiled. 
He is an irresistible genius. He has got lovely charm. And then he has got, uh, we have seen that uh, his splendid the tradition that he has, uh, the splendid diction, you have seen. Isn't it? Even single lines, etc. But he says, sorry to say that he is not a class. Not to be placed in the glorious class of the best. He can, he, you, can, you cannot place him, Chaucer, with all his um, uh, qualities and with all his talents, with all his genius, you cannot place him in the glorious class of the best. You cannot give a place to him in the hall of fame of the glorious class of the best. Why? Because he he is he has got high and he lacks high he wants W A N D or he lacks the high and excellent seriousness. He lacks. The high and excellent seriousness of that the scandiest of scandiest of poets that is grey. Thomas Gray. He does not have this. He is not a profuse poet. Gray. So as, as you have seen, he wrote very few poems, but he has that high and excellent seriousness of a classic. Substance, uh, substance and its view of things. Poetic substance and its view of things. Criticism of life has largeness and freedom, shrewdness, benignity, but not high seriousness. You have got everything. You have got substance, a view of things, you have got criticism of life, and he has got uh, uh, this largeness, for example, his largeness, his magnanimity. So, Jolin, although he was using the making use of, he, he, uh, may, he made use of the existing monastic satire of those days, largeness, but he did not hurt people. It's not hurting satire. He would hurting Satya, gentle Satya. He would send arrows and then hide himself and laugh or smile. That's what he would, he would do. Or keep his hands like this and smile. So that kind of gentle, gentle humor against his largeness, his freedom, shrewdness, benignity, but not the high seriousness. The snow cannot come bare. Chaucer's criticism of life with that of Homer's criticism of life. See that? Or Dandy's. Or Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's. Sometimes students complain that my last verse is not audible. That's why I repeated that. Repeated that. It's <laughs> understand. The class is all right. But then when you, probably when you get a recording of this, those sounds become very feeble. And therefore, sometimes it is difficult for you to uh, hear me. So it's inaudible, yes. So that's why I am repeating this. So did you see the difference? So the difference is that he has got all the good qualities of a great poet. He is a genius, irresistible genius. His liquidity, his lovely charm, the movement of his words, the gentle humor of his lines, we accept, but when you come here, and he says that day, there, is a, there was a poet in France, and his name is, the French names are like this, no? It is. So this is the name of the French poet, who wrote poems about prostitutes, criminals, underworld, dawns, and so on. So neglected people, marginalized people, or criminal soldiers. His name is, it is, it is in French, it is pronounced Francois V. Francois V. It is written for Angoyes we learn. <laughs> in French it is Francois V. So his ballad, Matthew Arnold says one of his ballads about a courtesan. In a prostitute, says she is lamenting. When she gets old, she is lamenting. 
she is thinking of her good old days, glorious days, and how how she spent those days. And uh, Matthew Lord's comment is that with all those things, if you compare all that poetic virtue of seriousness with uh, this ballad of V, this ballad written by V about the life of a courtesan, you will find that this is this this ballad has has got high seriousness. The criticism of life there is of high seriousness. The quality is there. But he says it's she, the high seriousness is whatever the, the, the whole thing. Chaucer like the high seriousness of the great classics. And he says the poetic virtue of seriousness. You, you will not find in all in all if you put all the productions of uh, Joseph together, you will not find that criticism of life, that poetic seriousness uh, expressed in this ballad written by Francois Vie about a prostitute or a courtesan, you can say. Exactly not prostitute, courtesan. Understand? So comparing, if you put, if you study, if you take all the works written by Joseph, such a genius, and compare it with this ballad of Francois Villain about the courtesan, he says that the criticism of life, the high seriousness of life, you will find in the ballad, not in any of the works of Joseph. So, the conclusion, the real estimate and historic estimate. Historic estimate, he has done great service to English poetry. Historic estimates, he, the, he is our splendid, he is the father of our splendid English poetry. Chaucer is the father of our splendid English poetry, unlike. But conclusion, he is not a classic. Like Chaucer, or even like uh, the French uh, writer of ballads, that is Francois Villain. But of course, nobody can resist the charm of one that apparently with the Suresh Sutra. Nobody can resist. I think you are enjoying, you, you, you will be reading and enjoying those lines very good, no? And you can see how every, in, in nature there is movement, among the pilgrims there is movement, about the professional pilgrims, farmers, <coughs> there is movement, land, there is a rebirth. You can see. So exactly like that, all these things you will find contributions of, you can, you can admire and admit as the contributions of Joseph to English poetry, but no, I see this, as, therefore he is not a classic. If a question is asked for a UGC net or your examination, why, why does Matthew Arnold say that with all his qualities, liquidity of movement, charm, lovely, addiction, etc., everything, what is, why does he say that Chaucer is not a classic? Chaucer is not a classic because he lacks high seriousness in the criticism of life, which you will find in Homer, which you will find in Grave later, you will find, which you will find in Francois Villain in his ballad on the courtesy. I think you have followed me. I didn't make things complicated to you. So I, uh, till we meet again, bye. But see that you read those first 18 lines of the prologue, general prologue. Understand? It's an injury. You go around just, just uh, uh, reciting and injuring. Make it a group work, for example. One the top three live with a shoe, Okay? So, till then, bye. Till we meet again, bye. Have a nice time.